Hello, everyone. My name is Nicholas, Nicola Darshi. I work in Cisco Tech, so I basically take the worst of the worst or the most fun escalations, depend how you call it. Um, shameless plug, I started a podcast over a year ago, the Cisco Tech Stories. It's available everywhere. It's not necessarily about Cisco, except we mostly interview Cisco people. The concept is really to interview support people and ask them what is their craziest support stories. So we interview uh, firewall technical leaders, we interview uh, people from collaboration, all the technologies, and they tell us their craziest stories. So it's really, really good fun. And I'm just going to tease the episode where there's a whole service provider data center going down, and the cause is just one guy sending a text message to his wife saying he's going to be late. So you need to listen to the episode to figure out how a text message brings the data center down. Anyway, this session is about uh, large public venues. <laughs> it's mostly based on one document I wrote. Uh, that document, of course, contains Cisco specifics, but it's really about deploying Wi-Fi in large public venues. So there's a lot of also vendor independent stuff on it. It is based on the many shopping malls, airports, uh, customers that I have, where they have design issues, config issues. Um, but also, I happen to be in the team deploying and running the Cisco Live EMEA network. So it's always great, you know, you tell people how to do things, but then if you don't do it yourself, it's different. Once you have to design, deploy physically, and then operate your own network, it's really another story. First thing, the configuration phase. Um, the keep it simple, KISS principle, I always love that. Um, if you want to enable a feature, always weigh the pros and cons. Like, is the benefit really worth it? And in the other direction, if it goes wrong, what is it going to break? Um, the users, they just want to connect with as less friction as possible, and they want to forward their data. They don't care about you, they don't want a captive portal, they don't care about anything else. So always avoid any over-configuration, anything unnecessary, so complex authorization flows, complex ACLs, rate limiting, all of that, I hate it. Just the most simple network possible. Of course, keep it secure, but that means disabling a lot of stuff, actually. That just helps. In terms of WLANs, I'm glad I'm not too, too much contradicting the gentleman before me. Um, of course, don't put too many SSIDs, that's obvious, right? But you always end up with at least a handful. What is the right amount, three, four? It's always hard to say. Um, but what I'm advocating with is to have a legacy SSID and a cool SSID. In the past, the legacy SSID was where you had 2.4 gigahertz, and the cool SSID was the 5 gigahertz only. I think now that's the past. But as we've seen with Wi-Fi 7, we require now AKM24. I'm ready to bet a lot of random clients from random phone manufacturers that people will bring um, are going to have issues with that. So if you need to always upgrade your SSID to include those things, the high amount of AKMs you're going to put on it, I'm sure it's going to cause a lot of client issues. So you're always safe if you say, you know, my main SSID, just the name, you put the standard name being the cool one, that's where people will default connect to. But if they have an issue, you can have a, whatever name you have, dash compatibility, dash legacy, the way you call it, uh, that's up to you. And they are just really disable everything, disable all the fancy features, make sure it's the SSID even the oldest device can connect to. Uh, it's up to you then to put them in a special VLAN or have special security if you want. Open roaming, I will never say how cool that is. I mean, we've seen it today. Uh, it's dot .NET security with even less friction than the pre-shared key, so I think that's a... That's an easy one. And guest, I would advise against it because I hate captive portals. Uh, now, if you have a guest, have you considered enhanced open? Even at least with the transition mode, because transition mode there is very compatible because you have two SSIDs, one visible, one not, compared to WPA3 transition mode where you have more than one AKM on the SSID and I've seen clients freak out just by seeing that. That was for the configuration. And I forgot about disabling stuff. Disabling MDNS, I think you don't really need it, uh, in a lot of cases at least. Disable multicast. You're always going to have some people, yes, but there's that special device. We may need it. No, just shut down everything, and people need to have a business case to really, uh, for you to enable stuff. What I've seen is over-monitoring kills your monitoring. Uh, so people have, you know, if they have a Cisco network, they put the Cisco uh, monitoring platform, but then they also have a third party. I've seen Zabbix. I've seen a lot of devices monitoring, and all of those have SNMP. 
and then you have a guy doing a custom dashboard, and that uses SSH, but also some SNMP. And then we see the CPU spiking every, every few minutes. And that's because you're polling too much on SNMP. So people say, oh, but you know, I thought your device supports SNMP. The question is, how much SNMP are we talking about? If you poll every 30 seconds, that's super aggressive. And if you have 30,000 clients and you're asking the client details every 30 seconds, that's way too much. Now, if you say every 30 seconds I'm polling for the device being up or not, that's cool. But then the client stats, when you have 20,000 clients, really be careful with that. Another classic that we also did to ourselves at Cisco Live is to have sensors, RF sensors everywhere, and then we run speed tests to see if the connection is good. But then the more you do speed tests, the more you bring your channel utilization up. So that's extremely stupid to do. Uh, what I like checking at as well, and the gentleman before me again said, check what's normal and what isn't, uh, it's manual AI. So you have a bunch of states, at least on the Cisco controllers, and the run state is where client traffic is being forwarded, everyone is happy. Then you have a state where they're stuck in web authentication, a state where they're learning, uh, they're doing DHCP. Know what is normal. So th always think, okay, if I have 10% of my clients, you know, asking for an IP or whatever, that's normal. It's people on the edge of the cells, it's people just with the phone shut down, like it's a normal day. Then you can see what is not a normal day. When you have a high amount of clients in a web authentication state, you're like, ooh, something is wrong with the portal. Something is wrong with DHCP or DNS, etc. cetera. Uh, and you can typically see it very quickly. That's what the AI tools we have um, uh, in Catalyst Center, we have AI analytics for this. But in a temporary event like Cisco Live, you have to do it manually because the AI didn't have time to learn what is normal and what isn't. So we know from one year to another what we can expect in terms of numbers. Another big hit is the dual 5 gigahertz. They look great, those APs, but in real life, you have some AP models where you cannot have the same power on both uh, radios, or you use different antennas to cover different areas, simply to just increase the coverage. Um, sometimes you do the same coverage, but then uh, the power is not the same. The clients are very basic. They're gonna connect to the strongest RSSI and not care that both radios belong to the same AP and, and all of that stuff. So what does this cause? We have this custom dashboard where we see top client count and we compare radio slot one with radio slot two. They're the two five gigahertz slots. And we see 200 clients on one slot and zero on the other or 10 or whatever. We know we have a good imbalance. So we always, you know, you can rely on the algorithm, have everything automatic, and most of your APs are gonna be fine. You always have that 10 APs that, you know, there's an imbalance because there's an obstacle or they're mounted in a way that you are not expecting. So it's very easy to have a dashboard with this and you go and check physically what's happening and you tweak it a little bit. The other direction as well, if you have APs with zero clients, it's normal if the APs are in the middle of nowhere, but if those are APs where you expect people to be, then think, okay, maybe there's a problem with those APs. And then you can check those APs more carefully. Uh, AI is typically not that good to know if it's normal or not that this AP doesn't have clients. Uh, so if you know your network, that's, that's very easy. Rogue access points, uh, a lot of people are deploying very complex solutions for that. In a large public venue, you're gonna to have to live with it. You have thousands of rogues and there's nothing you can do about it. Containment may be nice. It doesn't solve a lot of problems. Rogue bring two problems. They use your RF space, so you have less channel utilization possible, and uh, they bring a security concern. So I would focus on the security concern if they duplicate your SSID, spot them and, and go shut them down. The RF usage, unless you have an army of people willing to go on site and shut them down, like, what are you gonna do about it? Containing them is gonna make the RF usage even worse. Um, so there, I don't know of any good solution other than we sort them, see the rogues with the strongest signal, or if they use 320 megahertz or whatever crazy bandwidth, and then we go and shut them down physically, but only the worst ones, because otherwise it's just not feasible. Last but not least, I've seen a very large network for a very big event where they didn't do any TACAX or role-based access control. They had a single admin credentials that they were sharing in a WhatsApp group. Suddenly, the whole network went down because someone connected to a device, shut down a VLAN interface that was the main management VLAN, and of course, we couldn't know who it was, so everyone was hiding after that. That's it. Thank you.